good. So yeah, let me get a quick look at the calendar. All right, so we'll get started in about a minute, Ricardo. We'll let people, people are still logging on. Yeah, sure, no problem. Good. I see. And you sent me your slides because I'll get those posted in a second once we yeah, get the talk I, started. I yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So um, thank you everybody for uh, coming to the this week's version of the talk. Welcome back after our little break. Um, house rules. If you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in and ask it. Also, I see Gaston is here. So if you'd like to ask your question in the chat, uh, Gaston can, uh, can try to reply from, from there as well. Um, because then sometimes I forget just to, how things look for the rest of the year. We have uh, Ricardo today. Next uh, next week is the second uh, second day of the PhD workshop. So we'll have uh, we'll have three presentations from uh, PhD students uh, next week, and then the week after that, the seventeenth, will be uh, Monica Morlaco, who will be our last uh, speaker of the year. We'll be taking the twenty fourth and the thirty first off, and probably a week or two in January as well. We're still sort of sorting out when we're gonna uh, reconvene, but uh, George tells me that, that we'll continue this in the spring, uh, whether I like it or not. And uh, no, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so uh, good, so we'll keep you posted through email uh, when we're gonna fire it back up again. And if you're interested in presenting or know a paper that you'd like to see presented, uh, you can go to, our, go to the, the website and, uh, uh, and submit, submit your name. Okay, so, uh, Ricardo, go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks, Kim. And thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to present this paper. This is a joint, wo a joint work with Axel Ferrier at Paris School of Economics and with Gaston, also at the board. Uh, and the usual disclaimer applies. So the paper, this paper is, is motivated by the fact that trade through specialization has important distributional consequences. Uh, this is a well-known fact that goes back to classical theories of trade, but that has become the center of attention in recent years with the work of, with all the work on the China shock and how the big increase in, in imports from China have uh, affected uh, trade markets. For instance, the influential work by Arthur Donen Hansen, Pearson Shaw, and others uh, basically have provided clear evidence of these uneven effects of trade. Now you can think of these distributional consequences as the result of differential intensities across firms, industries, or regions in terms of occupation, occupations or skills, right? So therefore the effects of trade on workers will depend either on, on their particular char characteristics, either in the, the industry where they work, the region where they work, the firms where they work, and, and also the skills, the, their skills. So for instance, in, in developed countries, uh, increased openness has resulted in, re in a relative uh, negative impact on non-skilled workers in routine occupations. Now, sorry. So far, uh, and more recently, the literature has focused on understanding the process of adjustment that workers undergo as a response to increasing trade. For instance, uh, recent work has focused a lot on regional, migra regional migration as a margin of adjustment, but also as, as you know, switching industries or occupations. Now, what we wanna do in this paper is uh, take, a, uh, take kind of a step back and think about a different margin of adjustment and think in terms of future generations of workers rather than current generations of workers. If you think about most of the literature, what they have been focused, what, what it has focused on, is on the, 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 this adjustment process for uh, current workers. So, exactly what, what are we going to do in this paper? Is we're going to look at skill acquisition or college enrollment in particular as a margin of adjustment for future gen for future generations of workers. And in that regard, we we have two big questions that we want to try to answer in this paper. The first one is do trade shocks affect college, college decisions? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of theory that says that it should. And we know that this, um, 
you know, the, 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 the distribution of factors of production is, is an endogenous object. But, you know, we want to we wanna take a kind of a, a closer look at the data, in particular microdata, and see if this is the case. And the second question is, what are the welfare consequences in the short and in the long run of, of, the, of you know, being able to adjust your skill acquisition decisions over time? And so more particularly what we do in order to answer these two questions is uh, the paper has like basically two parts. In the first part, we're gonna provide evidence of the effects of trade shocks on college enrollment. And the way we're gonna do that is basically by taking uh, the outer door enhancement shock. And, and first think about changes in what we call labor market opportunities for people with different skill levels in, in each of, in, in every lo local labor market. And second, after looking at these changes in, in labor market opportunities, then we're gonna specifically look at changes in college enrollment decisions. Now in the second part of the paper, what we do is we're gonna develop a dynamic trade model with heterogeneous households. And so here we're gonna borrow a lot of the structure from the uh, macro literature and we're gonna consider a Nayagari overlapping generation structure in which acquiring an education is costly. And we're gonna, we're gonna consider a model with multiple regions and the way in which trade works in, in the model is basically through Hector only comparative advantage. And there's gonna be costly switching across local labor markets. So this is kind of a big picture of, of, of the two parts of the paper. The first one is more like a data part. And the second one, we're gonna, we're gonna propose a model to quantify, you know, the welfare consequences in the short and in the long run of, of the trade of the effects of trade cost on, on endogenous skill acquisition decisions. Okay, a preview of the results uh, before I jump into the details. In terms of the evidence, uh, we're gonna show you that, you know, these this trade shocks are more detrimental for less educated workers uh, this is something that, you know, as I said before, we, we want to first focus on, on uh, labor market opportunities. And, and this kind of gives us a sense that, you know, if, if you think about these new generations and if they look at this, if they think about these labor market op opportunities as their prospects, they're going to adjust and, and, and make education decisions based on what's going on with these labor market opportunities. And then when, once we, when we look at, in particular, at college enrollment, we find that younger cohorts actually respond by acquiring more education. But one of the key things is that, you know, we know that in particular, if you think about college enrollment, going to college is costly. So it's an investment that you need to make in order to go to college. And we find that only those families in, in the high, higher part of the income distribution and wealth distribution are the ones that actually end up enrolling into college. In terms of the model, we find that, you know, in the short run, basically the, the mechanism is basically like in Stolper Samuels and there's gonna be an increase in the wage premium that's gonna increase college enrollment. But this is gonna be basically only for the wealthy households who actually have, you know, are willing and have the resources to invest into a, in education. And this is going to lead to uneven welfare gains across region sectors and well and the wealth distribution. Now, in the long run, all welfare gains, uh, everyone's going to win basically, and 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 there's going to be higher college enrollment. And I'm gonna and we're going to show you how important endogenous skill acquisition is. It actually plays a crucial role in dampening the initial uh, effects, distributional effects of of trade. Right, so this is more like a like a long run uh, effect. Okay, so if there are no questions so far, I can spend like two minutes in the literature review. There's a long list of, of papers that have worked on on different things related to, to to our paper. So first, of course, all the literature on trade shocks and labor market adjustment. Here, in in kind of this olive uh, green. Color. I have the papers that I want to highlight. I would take some of their, you know, some of either either their strategy, their empirical strategy, or some of their modeling strategies, and we kind of use some of that for 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 this paper. 
So in particular, we're going to use the ADH shock that all of you probably know very, very well uh, in order to, to try to understand the effects on college enrollment. Um, now we also, this idea that we want to first look at labor market opportunities is related to this paper by Charles Kirsten Otto Wiedingo in the AER in 2016, who, who do a similar thing, a similar approach to try to understand college enrollment after the global financial crisis, then sorry, previous, previous, uh, before the global financial crisis. And now in terms of the, you know, the empirics of the paper, our paper is most closely related to this paper by Andrew Greenland and, and his co-author Lopez Tree, who look at the effects of trade shocks on high school completion rates. And so there's one thing that makes uh, looking at high school completion rates way you know, simpler than thinking about college enrollment. And that's the fact that usually people don't move before, uh, you know, during high school. But if you want to think about college enrollment, this is one of the big challenges that we have to face when we, when we do our, our empirical analysis. And more generally speaking, uh, you know, this paper is, is very related to some of the new papers that here I label as heterogeneous agents, trade spatial macro models. That's a little bit too long, but anyways, I, I wanted to think of a way to, to call those. And you know, starting with the work of, of Mike Wall and his co-author, Spencer Leon, and now uh, more work by other people that have tried to think about you know, the, the implications of, or, or the interactions between trade and the wealth distribution in, in different ways. Okay, well, I, I'm gonna jump straight into the, into the empirical analysis now, if there are no more questions or no questions so far. Okay. So I'm going to jump first into the evidence. Uh, I'm not going to, this is a slide that's you've probably seen about a hundred times, but it's just, you know, we're going to use the ADA shock and we're basically going to construct it exactly the same way they do it. And in the end, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how this uh, shock affects uh, college enrollment decisions across these 722 commuting zones over two waves, 1990 through 2000 and 2000 to 2007. Okay, exactly what are we gonna do? We're basically gonna consider regressions of, of, of and, and specifications of this type, where we're gonna be interested in, in the coefficient data. And here we're gonna first look at what I call labor market opportunities. So things like employment, labor income, and so on first for working age for, for working age individuals 30 to 55. And then when, when I go and look at college enrollment decisions, then I'm gonna focus on, like this is a usual in the literature, look at the decisions on college enrollment for individuals 18 to 25. And we're gonna use data from the ACS and you know, follow ADH to instrument the, the, Chinese, the import competition. Hey, okay, Ricardo. so yeah. Um, so your focus is on college, but there's other types of degrees that people could have that would be a trade response that would not be a college degree, like in the medical field. Um, and that seems like a, a pretty relevant margin of adjustment. Are you going to somehow be able to to think about those or control for for that no. type of skill upgrading? No, we don't. I mean, in the data, we do look at the difference between acquiring like a two year degree and a bachelor degree. So that's as far as we go, but in the model, we're only gonna think about uh, college enrollment. And, and, we, and actually when we look at enrollment decisions, we focus on college enrollment. So um, yeah, so if you think about, you know, in the job training or these type of things that you could also see people adjusting by doing that, we don't, we, we don't look at that. Gotcha. You know, I, I guess I was just thinking a lot of people would go into different kinds of medical degree, you know, not becoming doctors, but becoming technicians or veterinarians or hospitals and yeah. you know, types of things. And, and that's a very fast growing, you know, um, up, skill upgrading kind of direction. Um, so, okay. Okay. Yeah. But, but yeah, we, we don't look into those, but that's, that's a good point. Um, Ricardo? Yeah. So I have another question. Um, are you going to take into account somehow the co-movement between these variables, like um, here, the, the, the YRT, employment, labor, income, college? So what I'm thinking is that 
you know, maybe, you know, in every recession, we have a, a college enrollment going down. And, uh, you know, maybe everything kind of follows. It's not a, you know, it's not a big problem, but just to understand if there's anything special about trade shocks and college enrollment, or it's just maybe like a mechanical relationship from the uh, auto results plus normal movement between these variables. No, I mean, I, the way we see it is uh, ADH provides like a relatively clean shock in terms of trade that's going to generate differences in the wage premium across uh, college and non-college educated. And that's going to allow us to kind of identify, you know, how important is this? Can this, this type of trade shocks be for, for people to decide to enroll into college? I don't know if that's exactly answering your question, but I mean, I don't think- I guess my question was much. maybe, the, you know, from another literature, so we have the ABH results, and then from another literature, we know that when that, you know, school premium moves in this direction, then enroll, I mean, we have an elasticity for that from, so maybe I could just put together two existing things and, and already know. Yeah, uh, exactly. so what you mean is from other literature, we could look at estimates of the, elasticity of enrollment with respect to the wage premium and then kind of think about how the trade yeah i mean that's yeah, something that, yeah. mm -hmm. i mean that could we, be a benchmark yeah we we have thought about that uh, we haven't done anything i mean we we haven't compared kind of the the elasticities that we get to what's out there but it's i mean we it that's a great point we have i mean that's it in the end you could think of we here we think Thinking about the China shock, but you could think about other types of shocks that are going to affect. There's are going to affect the trade, the wage premium, right? And that somehow translates into changes in the in in enrollment decisions. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Let me, uh, Ricardo. Yeah, I guess another point kind of related to what Joaquin said would just be that when you're when you're unemployed or if you're not going to have a job, then it even aside from the wage, you might do more schooling because the opportunity cost is lower. Yeah, that's and I thought that was kind of Joaquin's thing. He said, I thought that college enrollment went up in the recession because of that, or maybe I'm thinking of graduate school or something. <laughs> No, I mean, if you think about, I mean, so for example, if, if that's where you're going, Joaquin, a little bit, yeah, I mean, there's there, these labor market opportunities are going to be changing all the time, right? So if you think about the the Charles Curse Not the Ego paper that I that I mentioned earlier, it's it's about how house prices are going to affect labor market opportunities, right? Or if you think about David Atkins' AER paper, it's the same. It's it's the expansion of maquiladoras in Mexico and how that affects like. You know, labor market prospects for for these kids. So here, kind of the idea is very similar. It's how is this shock affecting labor market prospects for these new generations? And I mean, and we're thinking about like, you know, in the short run, there are a bunch of things that we don't have in the model, right? Like it could be because it's more about an unemployment thing, and we we're not looking at unemployment. So here, in particular, we we think mostly about the effect to the wage premium. Okay, uh, so in, in terms of uh, labor market opportunities, what we look at first is uh, what happens to income, income per capita in particular. So we can see here that if we look at the entire pool, you know, and using the ADH, what you see is that the higher, uh, in, uh, the more exposed uh, regions or the regions that suffer a greater shock are gonna see a, a, a drop in, in labor income when you look at everyone. Now, the, what we wanna, think about is how it affects uh, the, you know, this, this uh, shock people across different uh, education levels. So if you look at what happens to people with only a high school degree, then the effect is larger. Only with some college, it is actually kind of small. But then if you look at, at the at individuals with, with a two year degree program, uh, two-year degree pro in, who had degrees for two-year programs or with bachelor, then this negative effect be becomes insignificant. So basically here, what we're trying to convey is like this shock is hitting the income of, of those uh, workers 
right? With uh, only a high school education. We get similar results when we look at employment. And here's, you know, the issue. We don't have data for wages per se, but we, we can, the, the best data that we have is for income, but we can also look at employment. With employment is, is a similar story. You see a, a negative effect to the regions that were more exposed to the China shock, but that negative effect is basically concentrated on those workers with only a high school degree or some college, while the effect uh, on here, here it is, it is significant, but the, the coefficients are much smaller. So we think of this as, you know, so the, the, labor, the, the labor market prospects changing when you have these new generations looking at what's going on with, with this, you know, kind of season work, season workers. So this That's is a question, uh, Ricardo. Yeah. Yeah. So like here, so this is pulling manufacturing and non manufacturing together, right? So do you replicate the ADH results that, you know, like um, the employment goes down in manufacturing, but does not go down in manufacturing while wages, the opposite is true? Yeah, we do. In, in the draft, there's a draft on my website, which is it's still preliminary, but the empirical part, we basically run the same regression as ADH, but only with 30 to 55 rather than 60 yeah. to 64, and we get the same results. But here we, we didn't wanna you know, focus on manufacturing or not. We, we were just thinking about everyone and then looking across the, the education uh, heterogeneity, okay? Um, so now, as I said before, what's the issue when we wanna think about what, what's the effect on college enrollment? The issue is that most, I mean, a lot of people who enroll into college, a lot of kids who enroll into college move. And so we know the identification strategy in ADH only works whenever there's not a lot of people moving around. So in particular, it, 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 I mean, there's some data that shows that about 50% of freshmen in colleges move to, to colleges that are about a hundred miles away from their permanent home. And so here, what we have to do is, first, we're gonna to stick to the ACS data. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna link people to their last year commuting zone. And so we're gonna basically construct like a measure of migration using the ACS. And that way we can link, uh, we can look at people, people who are living in a, different, in a different commuting zone after 10 years, but we're gonna link them to the shock in, in their commuting, in the, in the commuting zone when, when they were living the year before. And we're gonna basically restrict uh, our results to those people who enroll into the first year of college. So once you do that, then what we get is that you see an increase in enrollment for, in those, for those uh, kids in regions that are, were more exposed to the China shock. Now here we're doing the contemporaneous effect, but you could also think about, you know, do the shock and then look at one year, uh, one period ahead or one wave ahead and the effect becomes even stronger. So there's some sort of delayed effect, which you would expect from, you know, there are tons of kids who are not about to graduate and they're gonna basically enroll later on. So, okay, so this is as far as we can go with uh, ACS data, uh, but this already provides some clear evidence of this increase in, in enrollment. So now, uh, before that, I want to point out this, these results are similar to, as I said before, to this Green and Lopez 3JIE paper, but they, the fact that they look at, call, at high school completion rates makes things easier because you don't have to think about these, these effects on, on people moving around. So what about one of the things we said, one, one, of the, one of the things that we had in mind when we started looking at this is, well, I mean, going to college, is, it's an investment. You need to pay for that. And maybe not everyone can just enroll into college, right? The minute they, they see it, they see an incentive to, to do so. So the issue with the ACS is that we cannot really link these kids who are enrolling into college to their households. But they basically disappear from the ACS data when they go to college. And so one option, what we can do in order to think about how these decisions depend on, on households and wealth, right, in particular, is to use PSID data. 
uh, which is longitudinal data. So we can actually, we, we don't only, we can look at the, we can look at what happens for different levels of wealth, of, of households wealth, but actually we can also forget about the moving issue because we actually see these people every year, uh, every two years, sorry. And so what we can do is, in, the thing is that we don't have many observations. So we have to run these individual level regressions. And so basically what we're gonna do is, uh, we, we also do very something similar with the CPS data. And, and, but the thing with the CPS data is that we, you don't have wealth, you have income. And, and we know that income is, is not great as, as a, a proxy of, of wealth, but it, it works. So, but today I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna focus on the PSID results. So what we do is we consider a linear program Ricardo, in the model. Yeah. Um, I guess I, this, I should have asked this before, but you know, you're, the periods you're thinking about, um, you're yeah. stopping with the Great Recession. There's like a huge college enrollment boom after the Great Recession. And then there's also like a, a massive like change in, in kind of in the industrial structure after the Great Recession that is connected to kind of the China shock. So is there a reason why we want to stop in 2007 and miss out all of this this kind of um, important investment in, in education that took place in this other period? I mean, not necessarily. We could, we could actually uh, look at the data even further. And we haven't done that, but we could. So now, to the extent that it's an aggregate shock, what you're thinking about, right? The... No, I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, um, a lot of the final effects of China really were kind of intermediated through the Great Recession, where a lot of factories finally shut down. And then a lot of people then okay. made their decision to go into education because finally, like the construction sector went down. And so it's not clear, like the time, you know, the timing is going to line up in stopping in 2007. So if you could go further, it would be nice to go yeah. further. Um, yeah. And mean, then that's there's a, always just the question of, you know, there's also uh, a million Chinese students who then come to the United States in, in your data as well. So, um, but forget about that for now. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I don't think they would show up in any of this data. Okay. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, either it's you look at the household, and I don't think they would, when they, usually when you have these people going to college, you in the ACS, in ACS you don't see them. Yeah. Uh, but but, it, but it's a good point. We could look at what happens afterwards. And, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, kind of the Charles Kersner to with Ego paper, looks at what happens before the Great Recession, what happens after. Yeah. And it's a good point. We should look at that. Okay, so using the PSID data, what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider this linear probability model. And what we're gonna do is, is think about the effect of the China shock across different levels of wealth, right? So here, this is just a zero one variable that uh, tells us if someone enrolled into college or not. And here the beta Q, we're gonna have one coefficient for each, we're gonna think about quartiles. So we're gonna split up the wealth distribution into four beings and then estimate one for each for each of those beans. And we're gonna control, use the usual controls from ADH, but we're also gonna add a control, we're gonna control for a previous level of education and for the actual wealth of, of, uh, in, in, of, of the household wealth here. Okay, so this is, these are the results when you estimate this different beta cues. So we were, it was pretty striking to see that this relationship holds not only with PSID data, also with CPS data, this inverted U shape, uh, it's, it's, it's like out there and super clear. And so basically what this is telling you is those that are gonna enroll into college more are the ones that are in the, in the middle of the, of, the, of the wealth distribution, but and, and then at the top, it goes down a little bit, but still it remains positive. Now at the very bottom, you always get that it's not significantly different than zero. So basically what we get from here is that enrollment increases, but basically for those households or the, the, the not very poor households, right? So if you look at the, at the CPS data, for example, using income instead of wealth, you, you, you I mean, the, it changes a little bit here, but you also get kind of this hump shape, right? And I'm gonna go back to this data later, but I mean, I mean, there are multiple issues with the CPS data, but with the PSID data, it's pretty clear. Okay, so 
basically what 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 are the the main takeaways that we get from 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 our empirical analysis is basically these trade shocks are detrimental to labor market opportunities for people without a college education and basically we see that individuals 18 to 25 are just by enrolling more into college and interestingly this most enrollment increases from uh come from from top income households i mean this at least to me you know when when you're when you're taking the whatever first your first trade trade 101 and then you think about stopper samuelson and then you say well i mean this is in the short run eventually in the long run you know there can be some adjustment people are gonna are gonna acquire are gonna there's gonna be a change in the distribution of factors of production if you think about skill and unskilled workers i mean it was pretty striking to me that you know not everyone can go and acquire an education enroll into college acquire an education so Basically, there, there are some, this is, this is a costly investment and not everybody can make it. So based on, this, on, on these uh, observations, what we wanna do now is propose a model that we're gonna use to quantify the, long run, the short run and long run welfare consequences of this uh, margin of adjustment, specifically for the new generations of, of workers. And so the model, is basically going to be a small open economy with multiple regions that are going to be trading goods and assets within and across borders. And so in terms of technologies, it's going to be plain vanilla uh, trade model, Armington trade model. So there are going to be two sectors. We're going to only think about like services and manufacturing, and they're producing these intermediate goods that are tradable and that are produced with uh, two types of, of, of workers, college workers and non-college workers. And then these are aggregated up into this final good, non-tradable good that it, it, it uses some of these inter domestic intermediates and some of the, sorry, some of these imported intermediates and some domestic uh, intermediates from every other region. Now that's plain vanilla, you know, Armington model with multiple small open economy with multiple regions. Now, in, here's what, where things get a, are a little bit different. So we're going to think about households and workers. There's going to be a continuum of them who, who live for a finite amount of time. And we're going to think of them as, you know, making decisions at different stages. So there's, there's an education stage, and we're going to think about this as a one-time decision at age one. So this is here, we're restricting our attention to these college decisions. And we think that you, you know, basically older people don't enroll into college once they're too old. It is true that they go back to other types of training, you know, um, programs and stuff like that in order to think about skill upgrading. In this case, we're, we're gonna focus basically on college enrollment. And so this, there's, gonna be a, we're gonna, there's gonna be a preference shock that's gonna help us understand, I mean, to smooth this education decision at, at age one. They're gonna be uh, basically, we're gonna define a sector region as a local labor market. And there are also going to be these, these preference shocks and, and moving costs to switch uh, across these local labor markets. And now there's going to be a, a there's going to, basically the new, the generation's parents are going to be able to transfer resources to their kids when they're born. So this is going to generate some bequest motive. And this is going to happen, at, this doesn't have, this doesn't happen with a, when when the when the workers retire, but rather when when they are you know when, the, when their kid it happens before that when their kids enroll into college. And there's going to be this idiosyncratic labor risk that it's going to generate basically some heterogeneity across uh, workers' income, and they have the ability to save in bonds with a return R star. Okay, so going into the details of the model. So the technology we're gonna think about this, uh, you know, CS technology for uh, the the intermediate input in each sector, and here, so basically, it uses some uh, college workers and it uses some workers without a college degree, and there's gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, and the CRI is basically the pro Higgs neutral productivity for this sector. So here, the key assumption is gonna be basically that. Uh, well, one of them is that college and non-college workers are substitutes, and we're going to use the estimates from existing literature, which, you know, provide this sigma greater than one. And the other key assumption is that services 
are more intensive in college workers than manufacturing. There's evidence out there. And actually, if, at this level of aggregation, if, we, if we're using our data, we do get that, uh, you know, the, the, the services are more intensive in college workers than manufacturing. And so here in this sense, you know, we're, we're going to basically think about the usual stopper Samuelson force that's going to generate the changes in the, in the way. Now going to the final good, as I said before, it's there's going to be an Armington aggregator that's going to aggregate these import, uh, imported intermediates, but also domestically produced intermediates. And so it, the, the way we're, we're doing this is, is we're doing like a two tier Armington aggregator for the, the upper tier, we're aggregating across a domestic bundle of, of these intermediates and, and foreign intermediates. And then the lower level, it's it's just uh, you know an aggregate, also an Armington aggregation across the the intermediates from every other region, uh, from every region. So this is the the problem of, of the maxi, the profit maximizing problem of the firm. And as usual, you know we're going to assume uh, perfect competition, and so on. So we're going to get that you know all firms are going to be pricing at, at marginal cost, and so on. And the way we're going to think of a trade, uh, uh, this uh, an increase in, in imports from, from the rest of the world or for, for the US is by considering a, a, a shock to, to the iceberg trade cost for uh, importing the foreign, foreign intermediates. So that's, that's the trade part. It's uh, pretty straightforward. So let me go to the households now. As I said before, we're going to think about a dynastic framework with three stages, pre-education, education, and working. So let me start by the final stage, which is the, the working stage. So here, what the worker is solving is a you know, pretty straightforward uh, dynamic programming problem. And so it's going to maximize utility uh, by choosing consumption and, and, and savings. And Basically, after they make this decision, then they, they're gonna, uh, you know, get this preference shock, which is in the in the spirit of uh, CDP or ACM. It's gonna be it's basically what's gonna determine the reallocation across local labor markets. So here, the, the key departure from basically for, from say ACM or CDP is just that there's a consumption savings decision, right? So household workers can save and therefore consumption doesn't have to be equal to income in every case. And the, the budget constraint is uh, pretty straightforward. So final consumption, the expenditure on consumption plus whatever they decide to save has to be less than their, their labor income. So here the wage for the, the education level E and in labor market L, X, is the realization of the, is, is the idiosyncratic productivity of this worker and basically the return on their, on, on their wealth. And now they're gonna be subject to these to this, uh, borrowing constraints as usual in the, in the you know, incomplete market heterogeneous agents models. Now here, notice that education E is fixed. Once they are in the working stage, E, the level of education that they have, it's going to be the same today and tomorrow. Okay. Now let me go one one to one stage before to the education stage. In the education stage, if they decide to enroll into college, if they don't go to college, the problem is just as as the work as the problem of the worker uh, that I showed you before. If they decide to enroll into college, what's going to happen is that for two periods they're going to go to college, and they when they go to college they're going to have to pay the the cost of going to college which we denote by kappa and that we it's denominated in terms of, of the services that's the way we're doing it right now now the other thing that we assume is that while they are go while they go to college they are only going they can only receive the wage from uh, the non-college worker and they can only work part-time so one half of the time that they could that they can work uh, when they when they do it full-time um, so that's the problem during the education stage. Now, what happens? The pre-education stage basically is for the newborns, and it's related to the transfers that they receive from their parents, right? So you, you can think of the value of a newborn 
basically, as it depends on the transfer they receive by, by, from, from their parents, the productivity of their parents, the local labor market of their parents where they are born and the education of their parents, right? And so basically, what they're going to do is they're going to take the, the they're going to maximize the level of education. This is a utility cost of, of acquiring an education that could be related to the fact that you know you there are certain people don't like to go to school. And once they decide to go to if they are going to go to school or not, then they can choose their the local labor market where they where they they're going to work. So notice here that the the, the cost of moving this psi zero can differ across. Uh, age, I mean, here it's for the newborn, but before it, 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 it can differ across age and education. Right? And here, basically, the, 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 the cost of acquiring an education is, is, is also a, a, the realization of a random variable that it's going to depend, that it's going to be, uh, it's going to depend on the education of the parents and the productivity is going to depend on the education, on the, on the productivity of the parents. So what's going to happen is that parents are going to maximize this, uh, the, are going to choose their transfers to maximize their value at H capital JK and the value of their offsprings. Okay. So Ricardo, um, yeah. you, you might argue that X and C should be correlated. And people don't like to go to school and people aren't going to do well in school. If, if you added that to the model, would that change much? Uh, sorry, Jim, can you say that again? Somehow it got cut off. Sure, sorry. I was saying that you might argue that X and C ought to be correlated because the people who do well in school or the ones who are now want to go to school and they're probably the higher productivity types. So I was just trying to think through whether that's going to affect your, uh, the way your model works at all. Uh, that's a good point. We, I mean, we could do that. We're not doing it right now. I don't think it would affect uh, much what we're getting right now, but that's a good point. So here we're, yeah, here we're following the simplest possible way in, in just not having these two correlated, right? But, but they could for sure. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's basically the model for the households. And so let me talk very briefly about the education policies, and then I'll jump straight to the, to the results. Okay, so the education policies were basically, I'm, I'm plotting them here as a function of the parents' transfer, just to kind of get a feeling of, of how they look like. So for, and for different levels of parents' productivity, right? So for very low transfers, basically no one can enroll into, into college. And so the probability of going into college is zero. But then at some point, uh, there's a big increase in the probability of going into college once you have enough resources to enroll. And notice that that happens first for those with a high, highly productive parents, right? And why is that? Because if your parents were, were productive, then the probability that you're productive is also higher. And then going into college is also going to be a very good for you. Now, the interesting part here is that the difference between these uh, education policies is, I mean, there's basically, they look pretty much the same, right? Uh, it doesn't look like there's a big difference between uh, the different levels of, of parents' productivities. But the interesting part is that this doesn't take into account the distribution of people, uh, right, across these, these parents' transfers, which is if you look at, you know, most of the kids from, from, who receive low transfers uh, with, sorry, with parents who are not very productive are concentrated on the left, implying that they, you know, they are not gonna be enrolling into college. Well, if you think about the, the, the most of the kids with parents who are very productive are gonna be receiving these transfers over here, and then they're gonna be enrolling into college. So maybe the, you know, the, the the, the policy functions for college enrollment are not very different, but the fact that you have these uh, differences in, in, in the distribution of wealth play a key role in determining the differences in, in college enrollment. So these are just the education policies in steady state. And to give you a sense of what's going on in the, in the, in the, in the model. So let me jump straight into the calibration and into the, our, 
the experiment that we're going to do using the model. So the, this is where we could use a lot of your feedback because we're still working on the calibration. It's it's a big model and we it's it's hard to calibrate the entire thing. Uh, we, we've made a lot of progress recently, but you know if you have any suggestions, that'll be great. We think about each period as two years. So basically, we think about uh, these these households are born when they are 18 years. They they live for they retire after 50 years. So after 25 periods, which means at 68. And at age 48, that's when they can transfer money to their, to their offsprings. We're gonna calibrate the discount factors to, to hit this wealth to income uh, ratio and to hit the transfer to income ratio in the data. Now for the college decision, we, we take a lot of the parameters from a paper by Diego Darwich, who looks at, at a similar model for college enrollment and early, inter, and early uh, you know, interventions. And so we're gonna we're gonna calibrate we calibrate the kappa to hit basically college enrollment of about 36 percent of workers. So there's about like thirty six percent of all workers have a college education, and we we we're gonna choose this the distribution of this psi. Uh, going back to Jim's point, I mean here it's it's not correlated with the x at all, but we're gonna choose it such that we get this intergenerational education with persistence of seventy seven percent. So if your parents Went to college, there's 77% that you're going to go to college. Uh, chance that you're going to go to college. Uh, in terms of sector decisions, this is something that you know we're still working on. Uh, right now, we're choosing. I mean, we basically chose the 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 raw to to get the the variance of the shock to get like a 97% persistence in, across sectors in, in se sectoral movement. And then we change the, the, the costs to get almost no, no moving across regions. Uh, but this is something that we're still working on. And then in terms of the consumption bundle, final consumption bundle is the CS aggregator, uh, plain and simple. So the, these parameters are the same for all regions. And then what we're gonna do is calibrate the three regions. We have the, the, we're basically going to do this using data for, we're going to split the US into three, three regions, West, Midwest, and Northeast. And basically what you get looking at the data is that the West uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the low exposed in terms of the, the labor share in manufacturing is smaller than in the Midwest, which has the highest uh, people working in manufacturing and the Northeast, which is kind of the mid exposed region. And then we're going to choose these Cs and Gammas to to basically match the, the, the shares of workers across these regions. And to, for, the, for the domestic trade cost, we use data from the Commodity Flow Survey from 1993 to just get basically what each region is consuming from the other region. Okay, so the main exercise, we're gonna do a one-time shock. This is what we're doing right now. We could do other exercises where we don't do such an extreme one-time shock, but just like something that's a little bit, uh, you know, occurs over time. But we're going to hit the uh, trade. We're going to decrease the trade cost in manufacturing and services, such that we go from a steady state, which we call uh, the closed economy, which we calibrate to 1990, to a new steady state in which the home bias in both sectors are, you know, what's in the data. So basically, if you look at home bias in 1990 in the U.S. in services is 98 percent. It is the same in 2010. Uh, and in manufacturing, it goes from 90% to about 75%, okay? So that's the exercise that we're gonna do. So the dynamic effects first, just to kind of get a sense of the mechanisms, and then I'll go straight into what happens to college enrollment. Uh, first of all, the cross-regional differences. So first, let me show you what's going. This is, this is basically the Northeast, and it happens what you would expect. You see, uh, here on the left, I'm looking at college wages. On the right, I'm looking at non-college wages. And I mean, the big difference here is like, in, you know, like in, in line with the stoppers, Amazon kind of shock is that you're going to have an increase in the, in, the, in, the, in the wages of the services, which are expanding, and the decrease in the, in the real wages of workers in manufacturing, which is contracting. And, and you can see that it's exactly the same if you're a college uh, worker or if you're a non-college worker. Not exactly the same, like the magnitudes are different, but it looks very much the same. Now, when you look across different regions, 
then what you get is that this effect is amplified in the more exposed region, which for us is the Midwest. In the Midwest, these movements are, 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 are amplified. And so if, if you think about what's going, so this is just what, what's going on to all wages in general, but if, if we now look at specifically the wage premium or what would be the wage, what would be the equivalent of the wage premium in the model, what's going on is that you see the big increase in the wage premium on impact, and then it starts slowly going down. Again, this is in the Northeast. When you look at the different regions, you see that this is just amplified for the more, more exposed region. And again, all regions are exactly the same, except for these productivities and, 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 the, and, the, and the intensities, which basically allow us to hit, the, to, to construct the, the, the ADH shock in the model. Okay, so this is basically how it looks like. Uh, it's something that you would expect, but, but pretty much. The big increase in the wage premium, and as people enroll into college, the wage premium is, start, is gonna start going down over time. And I mean, as I said, the nice thing is that we get this across the different regions. Now, as you would imagine, this is gonna generate some changes in college measures. And in particular, if you look at the college measure in the Northeast, you see this a little bit of a wiggle here, but then it slowly goes up, right? Uh, given that there's been like a, an increase in the, in the wage premium, you see that more people are gonna, are gonna enroll into college and therefore the measure of college workers is gonna go, uh, grow over time. If you look across regions, then you see that here's where the, the, big, dif where the big differences come in. So you see the, the, in the spe especially in the, in the Midwest, you're gonna see that there's gonna be a large increase in the, in the measure of, of college workers in the Midwest. And here you see on impact and one period afterwards, you see a small decline, but then basically all three regions start growing at the same rate, right? So this basically means that there's some reallocation of the new generations of workers across regions, but then eventually all regions are growing at the same, at the same rate. So this is just kind of to, you know, this, this is, these are the dynamics that you would expect, but what happens if we look at the predictions of our model and we actually compare them to, to some of the regression that we estimated using the ADH shock. So what we do is we construct the ADH shock in the model. And again, we, we, the only thing we changed was this exposure by changing the relative productivities. And so if you basically take the three regions, construct the import penetration, and then look at the change in basically in college enrollment, what you get are these three points here. Here we've normalized this one to go through zero because what we care about is the difference from one to the other, right? And then we basically take the beta from our, from our empirical analysis and what you get is a pretty good fit actually. I mean, this was very surprising to us. It's still, I mean, we've tried different, you know, we used to have a model without, uh, at some point we had mobility, but we didn't have trade across regions. We changed that. We still get something very similar. So things are, seem to be pretty robust. Of course here, I mean, the thing is that compared to, if you look at commuting zones, the, the, there's a lot more variance across import penetration across the commuting zones here. We're constructing three regions only that's gonna kind of shrink the, the, the differences in import penetration, but you get this, this pretty nice uh, result. So this, basically tells, I mean, it kind of reassures us that, you know, the model is doing a good job in this regard, and then we can actually use it to think about the welfare consequences of, of this shock. All right, so now let me jump straight to college enrollment decisions, and in particular, who goes to college more, and who are those that are, that are enrolling into college. So the first thing I'm gonna look at is basically college enrollment across the, the wealth distribution and for two different regions. Here, I'm just gonna focus on two regions first. I'm, I'm looking at the West, which is the less, like the, the, the less exposed region and the Midwest, which is the more exposed. Region. Hey, Ricardo. Yeah. Are these all like steady state results or are these like in the middle of the transition? Uh, this, I mean, this- Are you lining uh, this up with like the time period from ADH? 
this we did with a time period of ADH. Sorry, I forgot to, to put that here. We're doing this after 20 years, so after 10 periods. Gotcha. Which would be kind of in line with. Uh, but then the other ones are, you're going to give us steady states? So th these are these here are all transitions, right? And then no, I mean the keep going going forwards here. These, yeah, that's what my question no, was. These are on impact. Sorry. On impact. Okay. Yeah, and I'm going to show oh. you on impact, and I'm and then I'm going to show you what happens after Correction. a generation. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, here what what you can see is that we are, we are getting this that the bulk of the college enrollment is coming from the top quartiles, from the richer households, and actually we see a decline. In the in enrollment by the by the poor households. This is in the Midwest region where where you where, where the shock is, is you know it's the more exposed region. Now for the West, enrollment is is, is basically unchanged. It changes a little bit, but it, it it's not it's not changing much. So what I want to do now is and I, I mean if I, I don't have the, the 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 northeast or the east here, but you would get something in between basically. So what I want to do now is focus on the Midwest region and think about who's going more into college. And so here, what I'm going to do is split, looking at the, at the Midwest, I'm going to split it into those with those new, those, I mean, those who have their parents in working in services and those who have their parents working in manufacturing. So you can see here that basically the kids of parents who are, were working in services are going to go more to college. Why? Because these guys basically, they, I mean, they're gaining, right? They're becoming richer. So, and that allows them, I mean, not only is there more incentive to enroll into college, but actually they have more resources that they can invest into a college education. Well, for the case of manufacturing, it's pretty striking how only the, you know, you see an increase in enrollment only by the, by in, in the top two quartiles. Now, this, this is something that we cannot, uh, you know, using the, using the PSID, we, we don't see uh, where, where parents are working in which, in, in which industry. But actually, if you look, I showed you the CPS data, right? That we were getting this. Using CPS data, you can actually split it into those with, house, with a head of household working in services and head of household working in manufacturing. And what you get is this. And so we were actually pretty surprised too that you know, those with parents in manufacturing, are, there, you don't see an increase in enroll. If, if anything, you see a decline around here. And actually, most of the increase comes from those with parents in services. So, I mean, this this is also pretty pretty close. To, I mean, it, it, the the model is in line with this with this uh, you know data uh, fact in the data. So let me go back to 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 the to the predictions of the model. Now, this is as I as as George was asking, this is on impact. So now I'm going to show you what happens after the after a generation. So after a generation, basically things start getting, you know, back to normal. And eventually, you know, this, this, this shock is gonna dissipate over time and eventually you're gonna get back to, and, and what's more interesting is that after a generation, the poorer ones are the ones that are going more to college, right? So you can think of this as a, you know, in, in terms of maybe this is on impact, the, the shock generates a lot of, 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 of uh, um, inequality in terms of college enrollment, but then over time, it seems that you know, the poor ones can recover and actually enroll into college and, and enjoy those, those benefits from the increase in the, in the wage premium. So this is very much related to transfers. Here I'm the same graph, but plotting, instead of college enrollment, I'm plotting the transfers that these kids receive from their parents. Basically what's going on is the, those who with parents in manufacturing, they cannot make the transfer. There's a big drop, not a big drop, but a drop in college enrollment while in services, there's an increase. And again, after a generation, you see how this changes quite a bit. Okay, that's for who goes to college. I wanna go straight into the welfare consequences. And this is, again, if, if I look at the West and the Midwest, everybody wins on impact. If you look at everyone, Right, uh, but if you actually start looking, you know, closer at things, and, and then you split them up into those with a college with a college education, not college education across different uh, sectors, you see that on impact, basically everyone in manufacturing is losing. Right, I mean, in, again, in line with this expenditure switching from 
you know, manufacturing produce at home to manufacturing produce abroad. But, and, and, and in services, there's a big win in the Midwest. In, in the non-exposed region, things are much flatter. And you see that the guys who, who win the most are actually the poor ones, right? Given that, I mean, that's because we have like a non, you know, we have like a, a curvature in the utility. So if you're not consuming a lot, if you increase consumption by a little bit, you see your, your marginal utility of consumption is very high. So you're gonna gain a lot from that increase. But that's only if you're in services. If, if, if you're in manufacturing, you actually lose, the poor ones lose a lot. So if you're a poor, if you were poor working in manufacturing, this is a really bad shock for you on impact. Now focusing on only on the Midwest again, and I wanna show you what happens after a generation. After a generation, basically everybody wins. It doesn't matter where you were working or what your education level was. And that's because over time things are adjusting. Not only, I mean, one of the key, one, one, one key margin is, is education, but think, I mean, people are also adjusting across sectors, right? So this, this is in terms of, of welfare. Uh, okay, so the last part, because I'm, I'm, I'm already one minute over, but I, I have like a, one thing to show you. So. How can we, this is, this, is a, this is a difficult part of the paper. How can you actually kind of isolate the, the endogenous education decision to try to evaluate how important it is for welfare? It, it's, it's, it's hard. So, I mean, well, here I'm, I'm gonna just mention something. We, we're solving the full model with all the regions. When we, here we're gonna, fix, we're, gonna, we're gonna solve a fixed education model. We, 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 we have a bug in our code. So we had our old codes with a, with, with there, there's an island model. So I'm gonna show you, I mean, but the predictions are very similar. What, what matters here is the difference between having a fixed education or not. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna compare the, our endogenous education model with a model in which the education is inherited from parents, okay? So, and it's gonna be constant over time. So if you're, so it's like 100% persistence in your parents' uh, education level. So the first thing that you would expect is, of course, you're gonna see, there's gonna be the increase in the college uh, premium, right? In the, in the endogenous education, you see a, bit, a larger drop than in the non-college education, right? So this drop here is all because of reallocation of workers across sectors. And this one has to do with the college enrollment. Okay. So let's, let's think about the difference in, in welfare consequences. In the endogenous education model, you see that you know on impact there's a big difference between those with a college degree and those without a college degree. That eventually kind of disappear, it, it, it dampens. Now in the fixed education model, that doesn't happen. So this difference is very persistent. Actually, it, it almost doesn't change at all. So you know, this education decision helps a lot to this to, to kind of shrink these differences over time. Now, this is looking at everyone, uh, absolutely all generations of, 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 of uh, workers, right? And you can see here that on impact, this, this, this basically, the, you know, the way education works is that it allows you to shrink this, this distribution of consequences in the long run, but not in the short run. But now if we, if we actually focus, this is the same graph, but instead of for the entire population, just for the newborns, for the newborns, it is key on impact, or if not key, the, the endogenous education acquisition margin implies that on impact, this, this distribution of consequence is much smaller than in the fixed education model, right? So again, in the long run, this is, this is gonna get closed here basically all of it, but also an impact, you're allowing this, this, these newborns to, to adjust and that's gonna basically, you know, dampen the distribution of consequences. So this is basically what we have so far. We still, uh, you know, we're, we're basically trying to think about, now, I mean, now that we have this, I think this is a great model to think about policy proposals and think about what you can do. In this case, it's a trade shock, but you could think of any shock that's hitting the wage premium. And that's, you know, it's something that it might be worth 
uh, thinking about how to use how to use policy. But I mean, the main takeaways is that you know we, we have these big differences in the short run. Eventually, they dissipate. The even though in the short run there are large and even gains and losses driven by region and sector, in the long run, basically the endogenous skill acquisition plays plays a key role. And to conclude, because I'm already five minutes over time, uh, I don't want to go over the evidence, which I already showed you, but instead I want to talk a little bit about the next steps. We, we're still working on the calibration. We're improving it uh, you know, slowly, but, but making uh, progress. We need to fix this bug in the multi-region fixed education model to make the comparisons that I showed you, but for the full model. And then as I was mentioning before, some policy exercises would be nice to think of, you know, if you can think of college subsidies, these type of things, how, how much would they affect welfare in the short and in the long? And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And sorry for the extra five minutes. That's okay. Uh, okay, so we will open up for questions. If you've got a question or comment, you can just unmute and jump in. Uh, one quick question, uh, Lucas draws here. Uh, let me see if I can. So, so there. So you 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 said that on your on your conclusion slide. So I, I guess um, so. The, there are two things going on on the on the macro side. There's uh, automation that could be driving a lot of this uh, stuff and and trade. And you know the the micro regression is supposed to tell us about the trade part, but then the macro kind of lumps the two you know uh, together. Um, so. I mean, a lot of what your results are, are kind of interesting and they, 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 they tell you about both, but I don't know if you guys thought about uh, a way of differentiating it. Is, is, is there a way? I guess there's always a tricky, tricky question how to take these kind of instrumented regressions and extrapolate to macro, but may, maybe, maybe you have some thoughts uh, on that. Yeah, I mean, we, we have thought about this. We, you know, yeah, automation or, or, or skill bias, technical change, shocks or, or stuff like that, right? That could be also lurking in the background. I mean, I mean, in principle from, you know, to the extent that these shocks are not correlated with, in, in the data part, at least with this, uh, with the China shock, then, then they would, you know, we would be identifying the exact shock. Not the, the, not the exact shock, the, the actual effect. Now, I mean, in terms of the model, we, I mean, we have thought about adding the, I mean, not, we don't wanna add more stuff per se because the model is already pretty big, but you know, you could think about easily putting in some uh, skill bias uh, differences in productivity and then, you know, maybe use some other part of the data to type. I mean, one of the things that we get, for example, from this, from our results is that after the shock, you actually see new graduates moving from say the, the, the West to the Midwest, which we know is something that doesn't happen in the data, right? So maybe using that, those that, that that other data, we could think about what are the other shocks that are going on during this period. I don't know if this kind of answers your question. No, I, I, I was almost thinking is like the, you, you have on one extreme, you have, uh, you know, this kind of outer or this trade uh, narrative, then you have uh, Chamoglu Restrepo, you, you, you have very similar Bartik kind of re regressions on uh, on automation, you know, and, and in some sense in your model, they're gonna have very similar effects. And, uh, and, and, and then when we go, you know, when we go, when you go to, to, to macro results, then you kind of take a stand. And, and in some sense, I think, you know, I could say that you are not, a, you are not fully allowed to, unless you, and, and, unless you tell me which one, which one it is. And in some sense, you don't need it. Uh, so, maybe having both or, or, or maybe some having a way of obstructing uh, from, mm -hmm. from, you know, kind of going for trade right away. Or, I, mean, or, I would say yeah, that, yeah, I would say that one, I, what I like about the, the, the model and the way we use it 
is that it's very easy to discipline the trade shock. It's like, you know how much you're going to hit the, the trade cost in, in order to go from this home, home bias to this home bias, right? When you, when you want to think about an automation, like, like a shock, like a shock to, to automation, I would say that becomes a little bit, I mean, or at least I would have to think a little bit harder about how to discipline that shock, right? You will need probably to see something in prices or relative prices or something like that, right? Decline in the sh in the share of maybe manufacturing. I mean that these these kind of things would be. Yeah, exactly. But again, the decline in, in say say suppose you look at the share of workers in manufacturing, the decline could come because of exactly automation, but also trade, but also even even sector specific uh, technical change, right? So, right. uh, I mean, I guess here using the trade shock, it kind of gives you this, I would say kind of clear statistic that you know changes because of trade. Uh, but I see your point. I can jump in and, and just, just wrap this up this point. I mean, uh, I just saw a presentation by Restrepo. They have some new paper uh, with Achamoglu. So I, he didn't have a paper; it was just slides. So, but you you may want to check yes. it. It was it was kind of uh, 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 getting at that precisely, like how the and he was he was basically saying, well, it could be trade, could be automation, and but they were kind of quantifying both in the context of. of of uh, manufacturing sector, so maybe you could use something like this. I mean, I'm just just drawing a thought. No, that's great. Thank you. I'll look into that. Thank you, Ricardo. Why do people move? You, you said people college educated move from the west to the Midwest in your model. Why is that? I mean, because you you have the largest. You have the largest increase in 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 the wage premium for the midwest right that's in the wage premium that's in the wage premium and and it is true that income in the west is increasing while income in the midwest is going down right but that's 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 true in the model as well and and this is something that uh, we, we actually, are, we've, we've been thinking about this for a long time, but the, in the end, what happens is that if you're, apparently if you're a college worker, right, on impact, it, 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 you, you wanna, you, the new generation wants to, if, the total income is gonna go down in the Midwest, but the increase in the wage premium could be so big and they don't have a lot, and they don't have a lot of, 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 of college workers that you would actually want to move because you as a college worker would earn more. Yeah. So what in the model is just preventing people from all moving to the East and West? I, I mean, I, it is very counterintuitive and I can see why the wage premium would go up, but I would think wages in general would go down. In the, in, in, the, the, West. in the Midwest, in every, the Midwest everybody. Sorry. Relative to the West. Yeah, I mean, this, actually, this is you're going to one of the key issues that we've been uh, that we were discussing a lot over the last couple of days. And something that we didn't look into is it 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 might be a lot of selection. Because you also have the heterogeneity in productivity. And that's something that again, I'm not I we haven't looked into this, but that's where we wanted to go next. Kind of understand because you have the whole sector, region, education part, but you also have the, you know, the heterogeneity in the, in productivity in your, in your labor productivity. So, but but this is a, something that we yeah, we're still trying to fully understand because it, it only happens on impact, right? And then as as I showed you here. That 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 moving only happens, right? So on impact, th th this is basically like a this is basically like a specific factors model on impact, except for the new generations of workers. 
Yeah, so I, I kind of miss the mobility assumptions. I, I miss not understanding why the Midwest doesn't depopulate. Uh, yeah, so. One, one other thing in this model that we are still, you know, you, you, it's a small open economy and you can have a permanent change in your net foreign asset position. So that might change your long run trade deficit. And so some of these- You're at the regional level. At the, at the country level. At the country level. Yeah. And so that is actually gonna play a role for the reallocation across regions and sectors. And that's, a, that's actually a, 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 like, a, like an important detail that we still need to fully understand how, how, relevant, what a, how relevant is the role of this, of this issue, right? Because if you think about the, the, the whole general equilibrium idea of trade and relocation, it has to do with, you know, trade is balanced. So if you're gonna, if, if, if your importing sector is gonna contract, your exporting sector is gonna expand, but that is conditional on, you know, some, you having balanced trade or a constant trade balance. And that's something that we're here right now. It's it's changing after the shock. But this is, I mean, you're you're going right into the the weeds of the mechanism, which we we're still we're you know dissecting right now. If I can add just one quick comment, is that there are mobility frictions in the short run. So there you have these shocks that allow you to move, but there's also the utility cost of, of switching around regions. So the Midwest will, will, the amount of people in the Midwest will decrease, but it will take time. In the short run, because people doesn't move, wages move. So that's, that's where you have this like big shock uh, on the wage prima, and then people that will eventually, college people will eventually move to the Midwest. That's where I think regards is, is a little uh, counterfactual, but we have these frictions to mobility in the short run. Yeah, but I'm not worried about the frictions. I'm worried about the, 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 I don't understand why they're moving in that direction, I guess is my problem. Yeah. If there's some fixed factor, regional fixed factor, I could see that, but I kind of missed if that wasn't, if that was there. Can I ask it maybe a little bit differently? Um, I mean, the this is an Armington model, right? Are, yeah. are the goods distinguished by the region? Yeah. So then it is like a fixed factor model. Like you always, people always uh, have okay. to so the products from the West good is still in demand. Well, but then I thought the China, the China shock was competing more. I, I, yeah, I kind of missed then. There's some elasticity of substitution, but as as we're kind of pulling the re those products out, their, their relative price is going to go up eventually, right? Mm. But and I thought that the shock balance. was the fact that the Chinese goods were competing with the Midwest goods. Sure, that's still going to, I guess this is that, about the long run. I, I was just saying like, there's a reason why the Midwest doesn't go away even without a fixed factor. It's because- Yeah, but here the Midwest is, the college educated are moving from LA to Detroit. Well, the Midwest has a comparative advantage in, in uh, services, right? Did you do that? The Midwest and services? No, I mean, the, the Midwest has, a, I mean, the, the initial steady state is such that the Midwest is more productive in manufacturing and, that, and they are producing more manufacturing and exporting to the other regions, right? But people are coming to the Midwest to do services, right? Yeah, because uh, after, exactly after the yeah. shock, they are coming into the Midwest to, to produce services. And services, I forget, are services traded internationally? Services are traded internationally, but almost, I mean, it's, it's almost closed. It's like 98%. So why are uh, they producing services in the Midwest if they're not traded? I mean, people, the, 
is have a negative trade shock. Why should I go to the Midwest to make services that aren't traded? I mean, again, we're, we have this uh, Armington assumption and they are, you know, everybody likes some services from the Midwest, right? I mean, I guess everybody would like to go and watch the San Luis Cardinals once in a while or something. So uh, I don't know. So, I mean, you can think about that example, but. Hmm. So, I mean, so John, going, going to your point, when we started to, to put together this model, initially, we didn't, we didn't do the Armington. We were doing the plain vanilla HO structure, two by two, many, small open economy dynamic. We know that the big issue with that is that we, when you have dynamics, you can easily go outside the, the cone of diversification. And then you sure. get all this. Sure, yeah. no, that's fine, but I'm still not getting, I mean, I don't, I'm not objecting to Armington. I'm just, I, I'm just not getting the full story why somehow this China shock on imports of manufacturers is hauling college educated to the Midwest. Maybe is it that they're complementary with the low, the unskilled, the uneducated. So that makes the return to producing services in the Midwest higher because the wages of the non graduates has gone, have gone down. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get the mechanism here. Yeah, no, I see where you're going. I see where you're going. We, we there's something weird, to be honest, there's something weird going on. I mean, like a G thing going on in the, in the Midwest, which is in, in the Northeast and in the West, sorry, in, sorry, going on in the, it's the weird, I mean, I would think this more as the 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 West is pushing people out rather than the Midwest. Why? I just start seeing. Yeah. Why they should push? What's pushing people out of the Midwest? Out of the West here. So this is. Totally, I'm not sure about this, but I think what's going on is that when we do the shock, there is no increase in demand for US exports because it's a small open economy. So, right? what's, balance, so what's balancing trade? I mean, it's, a, it's given that it's a small open economy, trade is not balanced. And so the thing Wait, wait, here, wait, wait. Um, that doesn't, I, sorry, I'm not following that. Okay. I mean, doesn't the internal, I mean, even a small open economy, in the Hex-Roland, we usually assume balanced trade for small open economy. I know, but here households, I mean, the way the model works is that households are making consumption savings decisions and they have an incentive to be saving abroad and they can. And so the, that, the, that stock, positive stock of net foreign asset position is gonna generate some income for the US, which they are using to basically pay for a trade, for a, for a, for a trade deficit, say. Right? Mm. And so when you have the shock, the savings and consumption decisions are also gonna change and what you can do is either in the, you know, make, save more, and then in the long run, run a larger trade deficit or de-save. And I think, and again, this is what I think, because I'm not 100% sure, is that this is, this is playing a key role for not generating an increase in demand for US services, right? Because if you, gen if you, I mean, here what you're doing is you're generating a decline in demand for US manufacturing. You're demanding more manufacturing from the rest of the world, but there's no increase in, 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 in demand for US services, which would actually pull the, pull, I mean, pull the West, right, up. And then you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to see these people flowing to the Midwest, these new mm. educated people. That's something that, so, 
and this is because of our small open economy assumption. I'm not 100% sure if this is what's going on, but I think that's what's going on. Because, right, if, if, if you would expect that, suppose that you actually had the rest of the world, suddenly the US demands, from, for, demands more from your goods, then you're also gonna, the rest of the world is also gonna increase demand for, for US services. And that would push the West up rather than the Midwest. Yeah. And so, I mean, the, the, here we're going, so to understand if this is the case, we're doing two things here. One is we are doing the same shock. We, and, and we did also a demand shift, a demand shock to the rest of the world for US goods. And we wanna see if, to understand if that's what's going on. We haven't, we don't have those results yet. And the other avenue that we're going is just to, to model the rest of the world, you know, make mm -hmm. it a very simple rest of the world without all the savings and so on. Uh, and, and I mean, but you're going to, to one of the key parts that we, cause, cause this wasn't happening at, this is, this was when, when we were doing the island model, this wasn't happening at all, right? Mm. But I mean, that's a very super important point. So if you think about it, right? That's, I mean, you, you need to make the West kind of competitive or as competitive as possible. And you can only make it by making everything super cheap in the West. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if that provided some additional <laughs> details on what we think it's going on. Yeah, it, it might be nice to just work out like a two region, one rest of the world version of your model that, that actually kind of closes it the way we normally would close the model to sort of see what, what's going on. Um, um, no, actually, I mean, we, we were just uh, talking about this this week. It's not that hard to close a model if you assume the rest of the world is like, you know, it's like fixed factors of, pro not fixed, but whatever. It's like perfectly mobile across one region, perfectly mobile across sectors, and, and everything is like Armington. Mm -hmm. it's, it's relatively easy to close it. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the next step we're taking. Because we, I mean, we completely agree this is, it, it took us a while to try to, and we're still to try to understand where this might be coming from. But again, I don't want to say much because we're not sure. So, yeah. Sorry. Did we lose Kim? I think we did lose Kim. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call like the, we'll stop recording. Oh, we didn't record. <laughs> Okay. So, <laughs> sorry, Ricardo. It was streamed. I think it recorded automatically. Hopefully, <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll call it quits here. Um, do we have more? Actually, we have more questions. I have a quick uh, question, Ricardo. Please. Uh, is there a way? Um, if I understood correctly, in your model, the production functions are homothetic, and yeah. so. I'm not sure, but it could be that the skill intensity within sector or within plant should go down. Is that a prediction? 